Hello. Come on, Miko. He's a good boy. He's got mega esophagus, and I'm going to put him in his chair. My nice doggy. Here you go. Yep, he knows exactly what to do. Oh, he's a good boy. I'll go down. Okay, check this out. What's up? My name is Keith. I've made a bunch of videos on this channel about mega esophagus. If you have a dog that's been diagnosed, it might not be the end of the world. Your dog might actually do okay. It's going to take some adjustments in your lifestyle. Um, I built this chair by myself. I'm not a carpenter. I don't even know how I did this. I just love my dog so much that I went to Lowe's and I bought all the stuff and I like went my wife had some fabric and I stayed up all night for nights on end and I built this. Uh, and all I can say is that, see how it has hinges and then it clasps open and close. And I put foam inside so it's soft. Anyways, it's not about the dog chair. I can make 20 videos. I, I could talk about mega esophagus forever. So I'm gonna talk about my dog right now. Maybe this will give you some hope or something. You see this? And I gotta get a tripod. This out. My wife has this this tripod I got for her for Christmas. Let's use this. Oh, that's nice. Okay, so this is Miko. Miko. He's a Lhasa Apso. He's what is he? He's 15 and a half. And he got diagnosed with mega esophagus like six years ago. And he was throwing up all over the place and shaking and shivering. And we went to the vet. And the veterinarian, you know, charged us 2000 bucks and left us crying, basically telling us it's horrible news. They don't see dogs live a year to two years max after his severe mega esophagus. And so we went home crying because this is our dog that we love so much. And instead of uh, giving up, we got committed. And we... Love our dog so much, and I, I've been with my wife uh, 12 years, married for 10 years. She's the love of my life, but she loves this dog more than me. I adopted him. So every time he eats or drinks, he's got to go in a chair for, you know, four minutes if he drinks, 10 minutes if he eats, or eight minutes if he eats. Depends on your dog. You can learn how your dog. And, and I could talk for literally an hour. I've done so much research on mega esophagus about the peristalsis effect of how... Um, Basically, like how a snake constricts food, all that becomes paralyzed in the dog and the esophageal sphincter, which is kind of gross to say, it's almost like a butthole, that your esophagus where it opens up and then the food exits the esophagus and then dumps into the stomach and then is closed off by the esophageal sphincter. So then it can continue the digestion process that becomes paralyzed. So if the esophagus is paralyzed and so is the esophageal sphincter and the food can't process and go down, then it starts pooling in the esophagus, which gets stretched out, and then the dog will regurgitate it. And then in the regurgitation process, if the dog is laying down or sleeping or it's liquid, it can actually back up and go into the windpipe and then go down into the lungs, and it's called, um, it'll aspirate, and then can cause aspirational pneumonia, where your dog can get really sick and die. This is serious. So, um, then hopefully the fluids can clear up and they put your dog on antibiotics and your dog can become antibiotic resistant and it's just downhill from there, right? Um, so what we did, my wife and I, it's, it's just habit now. But you can take a notepad and put it down where you feed your dog and you, like my wife and I would take turns, put Miko in his chair, 3.15 p.m. And then we would sign our name. She put the dog in the chair at 6 p.m. In the middle of the night, all the time. We have pages and pages and pages of notebook documenting every time we put the dog in, in the chair. Now it's just habit and we just do it, right? And if we don't put him in his chair, we physically hold him up. And I'm gonna teach you some stuff of cooping, cupping. Like he'll let me know when he's ready. He knows that he has to go in his chair and he knows when he's done. But I can speak the process. I'm not a veterinarian. I can't advise you anything, so don't take any of my advice. I'm just trying to show you what I feel from my heart, which has helped. So I pet him and stuff like this, but I get up on his neck right here and I rub and I can feel, tilt him up like this. It's okay, watch. 
basically, literally grabbing. Yeah, oh, he likes that. He's a good boy. Check this out. Let's get a little closer. Watch this. Oh, he's a good boy. His ears are so soft. He's so soft. He's a good boy. Oh, he's a good boy. Oh. Okay, so go like this. Cooping, cupping, cupping. Yeah, I can hear it. As soon as he swallows and he burps and it goes down, I know he's good. And then I hold him like this. Like this. So he's thrown up 11 times today, all over the bedding, all over the comforters, all over the couch. We spent $250 a month just cleaning up his puke. We're washing all of our laundry constantly. We've already blown up a washing machine. Uh, multiple carpet cleaners, carpet cleaning machines. We have special puke comforters all over the couch and the beds. Uh, my wife, night before last night, two hours cleaning the whole couch with the carpet cleaner. We wash our bedding anywhere from three to eight times per week. Where our water bills off the hook. It's a full-time job taking care of a dog with a maggot esophagus. So like this, I put him on my legs like so. I hold him, see so he's chilling, he knows exactly what to do. And I just take my thumb down in this, deep in the groove in front of the collarbone, and I just rub in there. I can get down into the bottom of the esophagus softly. I just rub it, whoa, he's a good boy. My thumb is going down in that deep into the crevice underneath it's deep for a dog there and I can feel it in there now if a dog starts choking and there's a bunch of mucus in there I, I really pay attention to these let me see you can go like this with his arms up and down you can go down back up down back up like you know working it down cooping I mean cupping I'm sorry all right he's fine now okay and then sometimes if he has mucus, you go up, down, up, down, it's it, it, either it's gonna go down or it has to come out. So if you make the mistake, there he goes, he drinks more water, so I have to sit here and wait again while he's drinking water. He drinks a lot of water, which is good. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about pharmaceuticals and city water because uh, millions and millions of Americans take pharmaceuticals and they, and they defecate and urinate, whatever doesn't get processed in the body, into the toilet, which then goes into the city plumbing, all the way down to the water plant, which gets filtered like crazy and comes back right into the water we eat and drink and shower with. So while he's drinking water, I'm gonna explain that pharmaceuticals, sorry, pharmaceuticals, when taken in mass studies have shown, can actually start to paralyze your digestive system. Uh, so people who take a lot of pharmaceuticals can have digestive problems. So I think does that contribute to megasophagus? I don't know. It's just one of my theories, but in preventative measure, I've got an 11 stage water filtration system and it's actually like a, a uh, seven or eight stage. So it's got a sediment filter, carbon sediment filter, carbon block filter, reverse osmosis filter, which makes the water so clean it even strips the minerals out. So after that, it goes into a realkalizing mineral cartridge. Uh, and then I spent $160 extra to get something called a pH Riemann, 70 trace minerals that the water goes through again. So it's so hyper mineralized, it has to go through a polishing filter. And then I even got another filter, which is a buffing filter. So the water is really clean, comes out of the tap. Uh, we eat and drink with this water, we, dogs and cats, uh, coffee, tea, everything. But there's so many minerals when we first change it that if you drink too much of it, it can give you like diarrhea. So I will actually 50-50 blend that with just a carbon fridge filter or bottled water for the dogs. All right, he's done drinking water. He's going to go back to the thing. Stick with me here. Holding his bottom. He knows the process. Come on. You just drink all the wah wah. Oh. Put him in his chair. Here you go. Sorry, I I I'm usually way more careful on the He's fine, I'm just paying attention to the video. <laughs> Alright, so I built this chair from scratch. 
Like I said, I don't even know how to do this. Uh, I just love my dog so much that I had a vision of my, in my head of what a chair would look like. And so I measured my dog and I went to Lowe's and I stayed up for nights on end after work uh, building this chair. It's got hinges on it. It's got class. I mean, it's, it's, it's a piece of furniture now. All right, so here's something I want to describe to you. I'm not a veterinarian. I can't give you any advice. I know that you love your dog and you're probably devastated that he or she has megasophagus. But sometimes Miko will have these episodes where we get really scared and we feel like this could be the beginning of the end. No. Where he's literally shaking and curled up and throwing up all over the place and like breathing and panting heavy and suffocating. I have this theory that when there's an excess amount of mucus in, I don't know for sure because I don't look with a microscope, but the mucus that he throws up, okay, you know like when you have snot and mucus? This is disgusting. You might have seen somebody do something like this or a snot bubble or, or you could like blow a bubble and stretches like a film, like a bubble. Air can't get through it. So imagine if the windpipe uh, not including aspirational pneumonia and fluid getting into the mucus getting into the lungs, backing up. But imagine if there was mucus, a bubble of a, a film of mucus going across the windpipe. So imagine mucus traps where the windpipe is, and now it's it's stretched across, and the dog's trying to breathe, and it can't. Like, imagine putting a latex glove over your face, and you're like, oh, like the movie Fire in the Sky, and he's like, oh. he, like the dog can't breathe. I, I'm over-dramatically explaining this. I need to calm down. You gotta pop that bubble. You gotta get that out. So, I'm not an, a veterinarian, I'm not advising you. Remember earlier when I said either it has to go down or it has to come out? So I've done something with my dog before that, I call my aunt in the middle of the night, my aunt like is like super intuitive and she said something to me that really clicked with me. I was explaining my dog, because I have another video where he died in the middle of the night and I gave him CPR and mouth to mouth and I was like praying with everything I had and the dog came back and like we were crying and like, um, that's a whole different story, but wake up in the middle of the night and the dog is suffering grievously and can't breathe and is throwing up all over the place. I intuitively could feel that what was trapped in the esophagus was not going to come down, so it needed to come out. So there's this thing, I feel very hesitant to share this in this video because I don't want you to do this with your dog and then your dog suffocate because I don't know your dog and I don't know anything about your dog. And I don't want you to think that I'm giving you any advice here because when it comes to the livelihood of your animal and your dog, which is your family member, um, listening to some random guy on YouTube is probably a horrible idea, right? So you should go ask your veterinarian. With all that being said, and I don't claim to know anything, I intuitively felt for my dog, what I had to do was this. Let me make sure all this water is down. All right. Now, I would say this is an incredibly dangerous thing to do. Oh, so I'll show you what I've done. If a veterinarian saw this, They'd probably scream at me and say I should be kicked off, uh, not make any more videos like this. I believe intuitively that there was a bunch of fluid in my dog's lungs in the middle of the night. And, I, and all I'm thinking is the fluid has to come out, okay? So my dog's laying on the ground suffocating, literally like, I feel like the dog was going to die. This I've done this many times, and to my hallucination, it worked, okay? So I pick up the dog like this, firmly, and then I, I grip him like this, like a cradle, and I flip him upside down, so I got his whole body, watch this. Let me back up a little. So 
I got his whole body like a cradle and I'm gripping his sternum. And I grab him like this. See how the whole dog is, I'm holding him. He's totally supported. And then I hold him upside down like this completely so the fluid, gravity can pull the fluid out of the lungs like this. Now he's completely upside down. You see that? Hear that? Upside down. And then I'll hold him and pat on him like that. Okay, he's okay. Let me put him back upside up. He's used to doing stuff like this. He's a good boy. I love my Mickey Mickey. He's so soft. If you could be here right now and feel the love that vibrates off this dog. He's a good boy. Oh, Gino. There's a whole other video about him. He's got a heart murmur. And they were going to euthanize him. And my wife, when he was a puppy, just because he had, a, it couldn't, they couldn't sell him, a breeder. So they were going to put this dog down. I come home from work and my wife's got Gino. Uh, he's quadrupled in size. And they said he had a very short lifespan. He still has uh, heart problems. He can't like go outside and chase squirrels. He could have a heart attack and die. But uh, he's my doggy. And my wife intervened and rescued him. Okay, so I hold my dog upside down and do cupping and keep tilting forward, back, forward, back, upside down. If you go too far upside down completely, then all of that fluid is going to come out of his mask and out of his, out of his nasal cavity and start literally dripping out of his nose <laughs> and he's going to start like... It, it's a it's a it's a gruesome experience. So I don't think if you if you can avoid that and not let it come out of the dog's nose, then that's a good idea. So there's a certain like point, just like if. Uh, but anyways, my hallucination was when I tilt the dog upside down and I'm cupping on him in the middle of the night at 3:30 in the morning doing this. All this fluid goes bleh, all out of him and all over the floor. Now, I'm, I'm sure that, it, you know, maybe 80% of that was trapped in the esophagus. The other 20% is possibly in the lungs. I, I have no idea what I'm talking about. But after I did that and I got this ball of fluid out of him, because I felt in my heart and in my intuition that that was the only option because it wasn't going down and he was suffocating. It was to get it out and use gravity. Um, once I did that, then all of a sudden the dog was not in a, um, a, uh, such a critical state. He was, he was much better instantly, immediately. So what I realized that, that even though mega esophagus is a physical disability, there's an actual physical obstruction happening that's causing suffering, uh, not being able to breathe, not being able to digest, all that stuff. So if you can remove the physical obstruction is, you know, food, liquids, mucus, all that stuff. If you can get the physical obstruction out. Um, now, I don't know about your dog, but like I said, our dog goes up and out. He gets really, really good for like a week and he's he seems okay and then he goes into an episode and has like a relapse and then he can get really really bad sometimes like a few times a year he gets so bad that we get terrified um and i don't know what's causing these up and down cycles i don't know what's in the dietary patterns or what uh level of stress or is it just the disease itself so i haven't been able to identify that but i can say that um if you understand that the problem is physical and you remove the physical obstruction, that's probably going to like help your dog. So if there's another thing I noticed, he'll be walking around like shaking and his back hunched and like shivering after he's gotten the mucus out. And I'm like, well, we got the mucus out. Why is he still suffering and shivering? I said, I was thinking about trauma and micro traumas and things like that and, and psychology and psychopathology. And I say, what level of that does that exist in animals? So... What I did is I test my dog to see what percentage on a gradient of this <laughs> this trauma he's going through is real or a perceived trauma. So it's like divorcing yourself from chaos and seeing 
Because when you're emotionally scared and you think your dog's going to die, you're like fight or flight mode, you're panicky, you're, oh my God, save him, right? But there's also, I believe, has to be a part of you that's divorced from the chaos who can measure at what level or percentage is real or perceived versus, versus an imagined threat versus like, we got to rush him to the vet, the vet immediately, right? Um, um, which these days and times you can't even get into a vet. You'll be waiting outside for three hours and they're only taking a dog in that's like screaming in pain. All right, right now my dog is shivering. Look at this. See those little shivers? Oh, he stopped. Oh, there he goes. All right, so you making all these little tiny micro distinctions and delineations between why is my dog shivering? Is he old? Is his body not regulating temperature? Does he not feel good? Does he got a fever? Is it the magnesophagus? Is it something? Because there's been times where I've been like level nine fire alarm. We got to rush him to bed. Oh my God, oh my God, Miko, Miko, he's going to die. And my wife is just calm as a cucumber, mixing her coffee. And I'm like, and I'm like, what is wrong with you? Are you like, are, are, I'm thinking, I'm not saying this. I'm like, are you insane? Do you not? Uh, my wife's fine. And I feel like I'm trapped in a Twilight Zone movie. Hang on. <laughs> like where I'm freaking out off of a real threat and my wife's totally calm. And then I realized that my wife has a very high level of intuition and connection with her dog, even more than I do that she knows that he's just fine and that he's having an episode. So I have to relax and <sighs> exhale and borrow her certainty at times. And she's right. The dog is just going through an episode and he'll be fine. Because you have to accept at some level there's things that you just, it's in God's hands. There are things you can't control, right? Some things you can control, some things you can prevent. And, you, and finding that line is, I think that's a moment by moment thing. Um, but I don't have the answer to, I don't know where the line is, but there has been times where I, I, I feel that the reciprocal is true as well, where she's been super concerned and then I'm overly calm and that's why it just takes multiple people, multiple perspectives, right? All right. So I'm going deep down the rabbit hole. Let me, um, finishes. Back to the psychopathology thing I was talking about. Sometimes I can pick Miko up and just take him outside and give him a pat down and say, go on, go outside, go potty and, and do what's called a, a near, a near linguistic programming is something called a pattern interrupt. So he might just be still going through that pattern in his psychopathology. And if you just interrupt him and get him outside and he goes pee and you give him some water and blah, blah, and like, wrap him up in a blanket, he might forget that he was suffering and go, oh, I am okay. <sighs> and he just relaxes and he was fine, right? Um, now, just because you think everything is totally fine doesn't mean that it is fine. And just because you think something's horribly wrong doesn't mean that there's anything wrong. Do you know what I'm saying? So right now he's shivering a bit. Let me pick him back up. I'm not gonna pick him up the way he's doing. Let me tilt this way. Yeah, there you go. Got a nice little tilt down there. Man, these new phones are amazing. I'm filming with the uh, Samsung Galaxy Note 20 Ultra. No, this is the S22, the new S22. And look how wide it zooms. See, I'm ADD. I'm jumping off the topic. Oh, that's Mickey boy. He's daddy's monkey. Oh, oh Miko. Oh. Off. You want to hear something crazy? I was, I'm, I'm such a workaholic that I always knew I loved Miko and he's my, he's my dog, right? I married my wife and he came along he was maybe four years old. Stop it. And he would follow me everywhere around the house. He knew my every step. He knew when I was leaving to work, coming home. I fed him. I love him. I took care of him. But I didn't bond with him. 
So, one day, my wife was at work all day, and um, I was home from work. I was taking uh, some time off work because I'm a, a landscaper. So in the winters, I have more time off, right? And I just went to this like deep meditative state where I just got really present. And then I looked at Miko. And he was looking up at me. And I said, Miko! And I just dropped down and I started hugging him and bawling my eyes out. And, and, and I realized that he loved me all along with complete, unconditional, full, present love. And I didn't even return or reciprocate that love at all like he loved me and ever since that moment my wife came home from work and i was holding miko we we're looking out the window together she goes she just looked at me funny and i was like miko miko so he's definitely my best friend i feel very weird and vulnerable right now He's your big boy. Why are you standing on me, Gino? Miko's your good boy. My wife uh, loves the sound of him snoring. So what I did is I got my recorder, my professional like Zoom recorder. It's an audio recorder, and I put it by him for like 10 minutes while he was sleeping, and I have a super high-quality recording of him snoring for like 10 minutes straight, and I've got it documented. He's a big boy. See, you're just watching a video. If you're even watching this, you're weird. So, there's this... Uh, you're just watching me on video right now, like pet this dog and use him as a pillow but what I feel is unconditional love I would there's no place I'd rather be this is my best friend <sighs> and I'm not putting all my weight on him it's just a little bit he's my doggy He's a good boy. He's a good boy. Alright, that's enough.